Hello and welcome to Submerged, a podcast that brings you stories from the front line of environmental research, policy, and community action from across Canada and the world by speaking directly to those working on the ground and in the lab. From climate change adaptation and environmental justice to fisheries science and water chemistry, hear firsthand how thought leaders from around the world are affecting change today and into the future. On today's episode, we have Mark McLoon, sustainable energy planner and one of the founders of NextGen right here in Southern New Brunswick. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, obviously working as a sustainable energy planner, you see a lot of advancement in technology every day. What drew you to working in this field? Because it, is, it can be so fast moving and, and so intriguing from the outside, you know, as an outsider looking in, what, what drew you to NextGen and getting this started? Uh, I think what drew me is I have a passion for, for energy and, uh, it's, it's just personally my interest in, in the field and in the industry. And, and you're right. It's extremely difficult to stay on top of the, uh, uh progression in technology as it's advancing mm-hmm. so quickly. Uh, I wish there was more time in the day to, to, <laughs> to read more. Uh, but we, we do, we do our best on, on trying to stay up with, yeah. uh, available technology and, and it does, uh, it changes very, very quickly. Have you found any challenges with the idea of keeping up or being on top of things, given uh, our location in New Brunswick, which isn't necessarily, uh, you know, the center of Canada or a big market in North America? Is it easier because you can be nimble or is it uh, just a different type of challenge? Uh, In a way, it can be easier so that we are nimble. Mm -hmm. But truthfully, I find for me personally, where I learn the most is when I go outside of New Brunswick and I I network and go to other, other events or seminars or uh, trade shows mm-hmm. uh, all throughout North America. That's where I really learn the most, and and it's interesting to see other businesses in similar size uh, in in different areas yeah. and how how they grow their businesses. Uh, but certainly, being a New Brunswicker it makes me feel very small when I, when I go to the bigger <laughs> cities or go to these uh, mm-hmm. these events that are so large. Uh, but again, I think anyone that has a passion, a certain technology or a certain industry, you just naturally start to absorb information wherever yeah. you go, and that just kind of becomes a topic of conversation who you talk to. So it's uh, it's been really fulfilling for me to learn more or have that ability to learn more by getting outside of our province and then bringing what I learn uh, mm-hmm. and what we learn as a team, bringing that back to our own community and saying, "Hey, look, this is this is what's being done in other parts of the world." seems to work really well there. Why don't we try it here? Yeah. Uh, and to expand on a little more, that, that does, <laughs> that's not always successful. Uh, there's technologies we'll bring back or yeah. new ideas we'll bring back and we'll try them. Uh, and we find that they're not. They, they're, they're, it wasn't a good idea, but mm-hmm. that's all part of what it takes to really grow and learn and understand what works and what doesn't. And, of course. But it's also, I think it's important to talk about those experiences all the way around. And mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's really true. The def- that's the definition of development. I think, uh, yeah. you know, kind of in a nutshell. Oh, that's a great way to put it. And you must, when you do those travels, have a great many opportunities to talk about the successes you have had here and and what has worked. I mean, I know, uh, speaking as someone who works in an office that has solar panels that, that you helped install, um, it's, it's great to see those realizations of, uh, you know, what we in Atlantic Canada see taking place around the world, but then act acting on it here locally. And, and maybe you can speak to some of those interesting successes like the Social Enterprise Hub or some of your other uh, residential or agricultural projects. Sure. Uh, well, that project, the building you're in, that, mm. was, a, that was a really fun project. Uh, and and we, were, we became interested earlier on uh, seeing that it really takes someone in a community to take that leadership role to, to mm-hmm. see the same vision that, that we have is like, hey, let's, let's really set an example to, and show everyone else in the community that these technologies work. So uh, Seth Askamaskis uh, approached us to, this was a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of his vision, his dream, that he thought that, that really coupled well with what he wanted to do with the social enterprise and with mm-hmm. that, building that facility. So we thought it was a project that matched up well all the way around. And then the other interesting part to it was that it not only benefited uh, uh, our, the businesses to, to learn with this, we also involved students and, and really made it yeah. open to the public. So we really not just talked about it, but kind of uh, acted on, on, mm-hmm. that, uh, uh, on that open transparency of doing a project. And, and so that project, uh, in fact, I just checked it the other day, 
it's uh, it's producing right on uh, on target what we Great. what we believed it was what we thought it was going to do and and uh, it's generating enough electricity to offset uh, an average home uh, in in St. John so that's Fantastic. pretty positive to see. Yeah, is is that something that uh, that success rate is that something that you find surprises people? I know a lot of coastal communities have reputations as being overcast or foggy or things where people make jokes about never seeing the sun, but I mean, we all know the sun is actually there. And how does that uh, mentality affect your ability to do something like a solar project? Do, is there a lot of concern that it won't be viable, or, or how do you combat that? Um, I, have a, I have a whole lot of different angles on, <laughs> on answering that question, but yes. Yeah, so yeah. You're, you're right, and that, that, was one of the, that was one of the first uh, uh, barriers we had to kind of overcome mm. in, even when we first began NextGen is kind of identifying those problems. And... Uh, Ironically, New Brunswick actually has the the most uh, sunlight in all of the land of Canada. Yeah, uh, throughout the year, it's and mostly the winter months, right? Like, isn't that well, some of the sunniest time of the year? And this is the, these are things that I've I've gotten to to learn as well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily for, if we're talking specifically about solar, you don't necessarily need to have direct intense light. Right. Uh, so, in other words, years ago when you talked about solar and the the viability of that, people would automatically think of a place like California mm-hmm. or Florida, somewhere really, really uh, hot uh, in direct sunlight. But in, in fact, in St. John, even in the foggy city, uh, and, if, and a few years ago, we started doing pilots and we started recording our own data. And in fact, we we partnered with St. John Energy to do uh, to build solar irradiance testing stations Great. so that we could really understand ourselves what the impact fog is going to have on, mm. on solar. And I'll tell you, it's pretty exciting to see that it it, it actually has what we're what we're finding. It, it can actually contribute to a more positive impact on solar. Amazing! Uh, wow. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, so to answer your question, it's it's a much better place to to install uh, things like solar mm-hmm. than than you would think. Well, that's yeah. that's great to hear. I imagine uh, that initial hurdle of of not just hearing that concern, but going out and collecting your own data is a great way to address any kind of issue like that. It's, it's not saying that, well, so-and-so believes this, or we found this worked in another Northern climate or what have you. It's that you have tangible information to say, we know for certain this is the case in our own backyard. Exactly. And what we're seeing now to take it a step further is, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, being a New Brunswicker and and, and learning and working uh, in the province, I can certainly say that we're a province that that trusts our neighbors, and we we don't believe we don't believe just looking at data. What we what we believe is listening to people we know, so yeah. our friends, our families, our cousins. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we want to see case studies. We want someone else to show us does this really work or does yeah. it not. And and that's been a large part of our business over the last number of years is building not just the data but the the actual case studies to. Mm to have those kind of references to, yeah. to show uh, to show people. Do you have amongst projects then a, a favorite case study that you like to point to? Like if you, if I was a new client and you were coming to me and uh, you know, I, I want to add solar to my home or think about a new build with solar, for example, uh, do you have a flagship one that you always say, well, you need to come look at this or see the results from this project? I think the, where we've taken our business is we, we've certainly realize there's there's more opportunity uh to support other businesses and and uh in the commercial sector mm-hmm. and the small industrial sector and that's simply because there's economy of scale involved and, right. and i think you can apply that with any business uh and most certainly with solar so the i would say probably our flagship project that we talk about uh, often is the first solar power generating station uh, that was built in new brunswick that mm-hmm. we built and designed a few years ago uh, and activated last year. It's just outside Sussex, uh, and in that project, uh, I, we I think we use that as most as a reference, simply because at that time we had enough experience uh, to anticipate what it was going to generate as far mm. as electricity. Uh, and and looking back now on the data that we theoretically thought then, and now that we've had enough time to look back and so and, and compare it, uh, it's right on the money. We're, we're bang on. Fantastic. So, uh, that helps to support many other projects that we've done. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think that would be the one that we reference quite often. 
uh, and it's also the largest one in the province. <laughs> so like, it helps you know, as well, yeah. It, it does, but it also goes back to my point of of the economy of scale. So mm-hmm. for us, uh, we, we realize that putting solar panels on homes isn't necessarily uh, the the right way to grow uh, a solar business in New Brunswick. Uh, in in order to grow a business in the way that we, that in the direction that's required to really support the industry, mm-hmm. we need we need larger projects that yeah. that can uh, give us those case studies we need to to have more of an impact on policy changes, regulation changes, working with municipalities and working with government. Mm-hmm. It's those larger projects that have a bigger uh, and more direct impact. So I think that we're going to have not just, we're not going to be able to just grow our business better. We're going to be able to have a, a more direct, positive, larger impact on, on the future of renewables in the province by right. those larger projects that we do. Has uh, working in New Brunswick had uh, any particular challenges or opportunities that you found? I, I know politics-wise, you know, if you're a casual follower, <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, I'm not speaking about necessarily climate policy, but just how renewables are supported by whether it's uh, incentive programs or particular policies from energy generation or how things feed into smart meters. or There's a lot of different policies that, that governments have control over. Has it been uh, something that you've seen progress in your short time working in this, or is it uh, something that you feel like you've made meaningful contributions towards? Uh, you're right. New Brunswick is, a, we're, we work in a very heavily regulated environment mm-hmm. uh, in, in the industry that we're in. I think that anyone that anyone that shares an entrepreneurial spirit can relate with me when I say that sometimes challenges also offer exciting opportunities. Absolutely, yeah. And and with saying that, we've certainly discovered many, many, I'll call them loopholes. Nobody likes when I call them that, but that's certainly what it is. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that was required to kind of kickstart the industry and, and get things mm-hmm. off the ground. Uh, and that's something that we've, 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 we've learned to navigate through barriers. Sure. And by barriers, it's not necessarily political uh, they're, they're, or uh, regulatory. It, it's, it's barriers in, that, would, that would be created in any new industry that's new in, mm-hmm. in a location. So for a small example, if you, if you go to any municipality across the province, each one would have a different way of handling the process of building a, a, a solar garden or yeah. a micro solar farm, we, we call them. Uh, doing any of these kind of projects because there's there's no there's no checklist to follow there's mm-hmm. it just hasn't been created so yeah. going back to the the opportunity side is well this let's let's, let's create, create it. It. let's yeah. work let's yeah. work towards that mm. so a large part of what we do is networking and connecting uh, people in different municip- mm. municipalities uh, along with uh, with the different levels of government uh, we work pretty hard at um, trying to fill those voids yeah. uh, and, and those missing links uh, to make these projects successful. No, I agree. The idea that um, just because something hasn't been done yet doesn't mean that you shouldn't embark down that road to mm-hmm. reach that point. And uh, sometimes in an industry that moves quickly or any sort of science or research where sometimes the regulations or the the laws or just the understanding of it can lag behind uh, those who are really innovating. and And you have to uh, it's understand that it's not really being behind. It's just that if no one's done it yet, of course there won't be exactly. something written about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that, that makes perfect sense. Um, in terms of uh, working in renewables, we talked a lot about solar. Have you been working in other types of renewable energy here in New Brunswick? Uh, we have, yes. And so there are really three three different types of renewables that are practical and, and considered renewable in the mm-hmm. province, and that's wind uh, geothermal and geothermal is you know, any time that you go into the ground to pull energy from the ground sure. or heat energy, uh, and then solar. Now, my uh, my favorite out of the three is, of course, solar, mm-hmm. and for a whole lot of reasons. So the first one is that there's no moving parts with with solar, and it's quite incredible that we can take sunlight and convert it to electricity. It is incredible. It's yeah. it's still I love talking about it. Cause it's just it's amazing. <laughs> And coming from a person with a power background, you know, usually you it would, it would, you'd need quite complicated and expensive machinery mm-hmm. uh, that takes uh, that takes fuel to 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 you know spin a turbine. Really, that's that's what it is, and yeah. uh, a lot of moving parts to create that electricity that we've all taken for granted in the last hundred years. Mm-hmm. Things are are really changing in a fast way across the planet, and and they're starting to change in New Brunswick. And yeah. there's uh, there's been 
the, the wind resource in, in the province is, is very impressive, uh, but wind works well on uh, a larger scale. And that uh, it goes back to that comment it, about economy yeah. as a scale. But wind is, is really still a utility asset. It's, it's something that utility companies will mm-hmm. develop and works well with that. There is a whole lot of regulation behind wind. Uh, and that industry still needs, uh, it has to come a long ways before we'll see more and more wind projects mm-hmm. happen around the province. Uh, but it, it has started. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as if we, if we compare uh, wind to, uh, let's say, hydro or water, uh, everyone is familiar with the, the hydro dams across yeah. the province yeah. built in the 60s and you know, with some of them needing refurbishment today or coming uh, soon. Those mm-hmm. are still, again, the massive, massive projects, extremely expensive and extremely complicated. Uh, and, and there's a lot, there's a whole lot more regulatory uh, yeah, uh, environment with uh, the, the, the impact that that has on the environment. So you, more into my world on that one. Yeah. Water and, you, and you, resources. Yeah. yeah. And you can see yeah. why mm-hmm. for a, uh, for a small company in the province wanting to build a business around renewables, solar just happens yeah. to be the perfect fit. Uh, and to, kind of walk that back a little bit uh, solar is not necessarily the the first thing that any business or or farm or even homeowner jumps to first solar is actually ironically the last thing that you consider really? at a renewable yeah. and, that, and that's important to kind of talk about that a little bit because if we, if we look at the value of money and if we compare what is possible for a building owner or a homeowner to do first before investing in generating their own electricity. Mm-hmm. So in other words, if they can make their, their building or home more efficient to, to start out with, and, and I'll talk about homes first, because I think a sure. lot of people can relate to that quite easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to make sure that you have the best insulation you can, uh, or the most insulation. You want to make sure your home is sealed properly. Uh, and, and you also want to make sure that you're, you're using the, the, the best technologies you can, and that's yeah. with lighting or heating systems. And once you, because then really what you're doing is reducing the amount of, of energy you consume throughout the year to begin with. Mm-hmm. That's That would be the first step. And then the, you know, it's, we call it the energy pyramid. So you go through these steps to get to that, the top of the pyramid. And that's where our, our focus is, is, mm. is uh, once you know that magic number of how much energy you consume throughout a year, then you can look at making that, that net zero energy target uh, which is what we do for designing solar. Yeah. No, I think that's important to note as well. Um, for all energy discussions is that idea that in a lot of cases, uh, your best move is often efficiency or just reduction in, in use before anything else. I, yeah. I see that in a great deal of, of, of sectors and, and doesn't have to be energy in the terms of electricity either. It's pretty much just conservation of yeah. energy in general. I, you I often think of that, yeah. you know, that little green triangle, re- reduce, reuse, yep. recycle. I often think of that as you want to reduce first. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then you want to, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's the right way to, to follow. Yeah. That. In solid waste, that's definitely true. You want yeah. less that you have to process and less that you have to yeah. deal with. Uh, thinking of the amount and sort of stockpiling that is storage, something that you, uh, have dealt a lot with. I know we hear a lot, again, this is an outside perspective that I'm sure a lot of people share, that one of the c- concerns around something like solar is what happens uh, when there's either an overgeneration or an undergeneration to meet demand. I mean, is it something that's scaling well or are we feeding back into the grid? What's what's the story here in New Brunswick? We're, that's, a, that's a broad question. <laughs> we're entering, <laughs> I, I we're entering that, yeah. a whole new energy era. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really the transformation of the way that we use energy, how we interact with it, and how we become more sustainable uh, on, on, an energy, on an energy side. And uh, Many people have heard the term smart grid or smart meters mm-hmm. or uh, the green energy. You know, there's all kinds of different uh, names and categories, but it really does all link back together of one simple uh, idea of using energy more wisely, mm-hmm. and 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 by that, uh, with a like for a microgrid, uh, for an example, a microgrid is it would be a, a small group or a small location being able to share in the resources of renewable energy and and endless endless storage. Mm. So right, that's like the holy grail of of renewables right now is to, is to determine on how to how to capture and store electricity when it's not being generated. Yeah. Uh, so for example, if the wind's not blowing, uh, you, you don't, you're not making 
electricity with wind turbines. Mm -hmm. uh, if the water's not high or flowing, you're not making electricity with, with water turbines. And if it's at nighttime, you're not going to make electricity with solar. So mm -hmm. the, how to integrate all those together, that, that is where the market is, is yeah. heading. Uh, kind of, you know, uh, kind of a broad brush. Um, and that is an industry that we're heavily involved with in, in helping to support Great. and grow, yeah. uh, along with supporting our utilities to explore that as well. And it's it's really exciting to be in this industry. And what's what's pushing it is, and what's interesting is being pushed from every angle. Mm -hmm. uh, transportation, for example, with electric vehicles and where that's that's, yeah. that's really that's the catalyst of what we're seeing happen in energy storage. Mm. And what's, what's funny is, uh, so for a few years ago, if we were to buy a, a battery, let's say a lithium ion yeah. battery, uh, it, it was, it, it, and it is still expensive, but it was, it was all, it was too expensive uh, even a few years ago for it to be practical. Mm. So there was really only a few early adopters in the province. Now we're finding it's, it's still, uh, it's, it's right at the cusp of, it, it makes perfect sense for commercial and small industrial to use it for a whole other purpose other mm. than just backup storage. We use it to you know, clean electricity or to lower peak demand. There's, there's all kinds of other reasons we'd Great. use that. Uh, but what's really interesting is because uh, of the mass production of electric vehicles, that's pushing the cost of storage way down. And as it is today, we can buy an electric vehicle and park it in the, <laughs> in the, in the parking lot and plug it into a building for less than what it costs us to buy uh, just a standalone storage system. So mm. that, to, you know, this kind of rolls back on what you're asking. Yeah. We're seeing the changing in technologies. That's one of them. It's, uh, we're, we're seeing it being hit from every angle and, yeah, and all amazing. kind of connecting at, at one point. Yeah, it's great to see different, uh, what people would look outwardly as very different uh, industries or, or uh, avenues of innovation to end up pushing together. So this change in... Uh, vehicle technology and, you know, people migrating to, you know, wanting to reduce their fuel costs, for example, might be the impetus to mm. get an electric car, which then can feed into this bigger systems change around the electric grid, which is a fascinating loop to think about. It really is. It's, yeah. And it's all connected. And, and I think one, one of the biggest parts of our business is to do energy studies. Mm -hmm. So we, a large part of it is we do the energy studies of commercial and small industrial buildings and try to help determine that path first towards sustainable energy and, yeah. and the ultimate goal is that we would well even last year our ultimate goal was to, to design with net zero in mind now net zero means you're going to be able to produce as much energy as that you would consume throughout a year what's really interesting today is that now we're designing for net positive Great. And net positive means we're going to produce a little bit more than what you would need mm. throughout the year and that's strictly because we're seeing more facilities adopt electric vehicles and electric uh, forklifts, uh, yeah. anything at all that they might have to use their facility to, to charge electrically, charge something else, mm -hmm. then that moves right into the, the net positive uh, category. So it's, it's quite exciting. Wow. Well, I think it's been a fantastic opportunity having you here to walk through a lot of these changes with us. Uh, I know how uh, in a rapidly evolving industry in any of any type that those who don't live it and breathe it every day can see the pace that it moves and be almost uh, overwhelmed by, you know, as you mentioned, lots of people here, smart grid and smart meters. And there's a lot of that superficial understanding, but really knowing what does that mean for me as a business owner or as a homeowner or as someone looking for a new vehicle, you know, how does this all fit together? It's great to hear that there are people that are not just actively uh, out there assisting with these technologies, but um, studying their impacts and, and all of that as well. And it's great to hear that that's a key part of what you're doing is that, that energy study piece. Um, what sort of one final question, I think, before we go today is what do you see amongst all of these changes as the sort of next uh, big move that, that you're going to take perhaps or that you see happening in Atlantic Canada for, you know, is it a shift in, the vehicles we talked about, is it uh, more companies getting on board with renewables? Like what's the, the next thing that's really going to change the landscape? The next thing that is going to have to happen to really impact and change the landscape is change with policy and mm -hmm. change with our Electricity Act. Uh, I think that once, once that's accomplished, we'll see, we'll see an immediate uh, large impact in, in our own province in New Brunswick. And mm -hmm. I'm saying that 
mostly because the technologies and the, and the discussions we're having around these technologies, they're they're not new, and it's not they're not they weren't just made yesterday. These are a number of years. All of these technologies yeah, yeah. have been have been in development across the planet. And uh, going back to um, when I said that I when I step outside the province, I feel like that little New Brunswick <laughs> and I'm going to these large cities yeah. where. Uh, this is reality. Microgrids are reality. Electric vehicles, uh, solar, uh, wind, mm-hmm. all of these things are, are just booming all over the planet. Uh, so I think that it's it's inevitable that that is going to be a re, uh, you know common day uh, place here in New Brunswick uh, when policy uh, allows that to be adopted a little mm-hmm. faster. Well, it's great to hear from Mark McLoon here at uh, NextGen, a sustainable energy planner and one of the founders. Uh, Again, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Submerged. Upcoming episodes will feature interviews with individuals from across the region and the country. So be sure to subscribe to our feed and follow our podcast by visiting acapsj.org as Submerged continues to bring you stories from the front line of environmental research, policy, and action from across Canada. Until next time, I'm Graham Stewart-Robertson. Submerged has been produced and distributed to you by ACAP St. John, an environmental nonprofit working in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada, since 1992.